We are very excited to get started. So I am going to kick it off by just getting started with Dan. Hello, Dan. Uh, thanks for being here. Thanks for selecting me to be part of this uh, process. And so our first question is gonna pick up just where Andrea left off. Let's talk a little bit about servant leadership. Um, Robert Greenleaf, of course, has uh, coined this servant leadership turn. And um, of course, you've talked a lot about moral leadership and value-based leadership. So could you talk us, to us a little bit about what it means to be a servant leader and how you see value, values-based leadership? Yeah, sure. Um, maybe I can just start off thanking uh, Andrea um, for all she does uh, with Culture, uh, Culture Shift Labs. Um, She's an amazing uh, role model uh, and inspiration. And Allie, we love working with you uh, and everyone at Village Capital. Uh, and thank you for that really kind introduction. And Lisa, you don't know, but we have actually a lot of things uh, in common. So I went to uh, New York University uh, for my uh, graduate school uh, at night. Um, I was turned down twice at Harvard, <laughs> both undergraduate and graduate school. Uh, unceremoniously and probably well-deserved. And my daughter went to Tufts University. So we, we have a lot in common. Oh, we have a lot in common. And you know, we also know Shelly Zalis as well. Yes. And the yes. past company. So we yeah. have a lot in common. <laughs> uh, that's great. So um, I think um, just in terms of servant leadership or really authentic leadership, I really believe that... Um, one should approach leadership in a very authentic way. Um, my daughter once asked me, she said, Dad, are you the same person at work as you are at home? Um, she asked me this when she was little, and I said, yeah, except I don't tickle anybody at work. And uh, she said, I'm glad to hear that, Dad. Um, and um, I just think being yourself, bringing your values, um, not uh, feeling like you need to be something different in a professional environment than who you are um, is extraordinarily important. And I think one of the most important things that a CEO can do, um, and this has taken me some time because I'm a very operationally oriented uh, CEO. I love the numbers. My team will tell you I know every single number. But the most important thing that um, that I think I do is I keep our mission front and center. What are we really trying to accomplish uh, as a company? How can we really make a difference? And then I act on the values that support that mission. And those values um, in a culturally charged environment that we all live in are not always easy to live up to, to stand up to. I am um, constantly um, uh, having some death threat. Um, I have a couple of armed people outside my house right now because of um, some, uh, um, you know, threats um, because we took down some um, far right groups um, from fundraising um, around the election and uh, because of, they advocated hatred or racial intolerance. Um, and so I think having these values front and center, treating everybody with respect, uh, putting a multi-constituent lens on everything we do, um, I think enables me to be the leader that I want to be. Um, at PayPal and not uh, something that I have to turn on and off when I go into work. Thanks so much, Dan. So let's talk a little bit now about how you grew up. Uh, you have actually said, and I'm gonna read here, uh, you told the New York Times, I was born with social activism in my DNA. My grandfather was a union organizer in the garment district in New York City. My mother took me to a civil rights demonstration in Washington in my stroller. And of course, I also read about you actually running into your mother at one of those civil rights demonstrations some years <laughs> later, as I think she was on the side and you were participating. So let's talk a little bit about uh, that in relation to authentic leadership, because what we know from a lot of research is that people who grow up 
in right, uh, multicultural, multi-ethnic, um, diverse environments often, right? Do they, they're more dexterity, uh, they have more dexterity adaptability, but also they're often more, less afraid of what we might call the other. So tell us a little bit about your, your experiences growing up and in particular, uh, this relationship to, the, to civil rights. Yeah. Well, my dad told me, he once said, son, one thing you can't choose is your parents. Um, and, um, uh, and, uh, so true. So <laughs> true. <laughs> yeah. I was very fortunate in that, um, you know, my mom and dad, uh, really are my heroes. Um, and, um, they're the people that, uh, I looked up to all my life. Um, and, um, you know, they, um, they've been social activists from the very, very beginning. When I was little, we moved to a fully integrated neighborhood. My mom thought that that was very important um, for her kids to grow up in an integrated neighborhood. My dad, I remember so clearly, um, my dad um, um, uh, ran a, a plant in Pascagoula, Mississippi. This is in the 1960s. I was just a little kid at the time. And um, there was a plant manager down there. And, you know, the plant managers were like, they ruled uh, in Mississippi uh, at that point. Uh, he was a white guy and he fired um, this black guy for drinking at the wrong water fountain. And this like I worked for my dad, didn't work for the plant manager. The plant manager didn't work for my dad. And so my dad traveled down to Mississippi um, to reinstate um, this black worker. And I remember the fear that my mom had waiting by the phone to see if my dad was going to be okay, if he was going to be uh, beaten up, you know, because there was a lot of violence at the time. And I saw what it takes to stand up for values, to have courage. You know, my mom pushed me in a baby carriage at a bunch of civil rights marches. And I remember my dad saying to my mom, now, why are you doing that? Like, he's gonna be the youngest kid to have his picture in an FBI file. Um, and, um, and my mom said, I think it's just really important. And so these are just the ways that I grew up and, um, and I just kind of understood that fighting for economic equality, fighting for social justice um, was something that um, may be difficult to do, and it is hard to go do, but we must do it. We all live in the same community together. Um, this is our neighborhoods, our companies, our economy, our country. And, um, you know, we are a very divided country. There's no question about it. There are a lot of cultural wars, but that doesn't absolve us from taking values based stance and doing our part to try and help. And I feel that very passionately, as you can probably tell. Thank you. Yeah. So my next question is to lead us a little bit into some of your work um, at PayPal. And so how you frame, I say this a lot, how you frame something is what you get often. So if you frame something as a problem, and this goes back to something that Andrea was saying, right, in sort of the asset versus deficit model or abundance versus non. Um, and sometimes people will frame, obviously, diversity, equity, and inclusion as a problem that needs to be solved as opposed to an asset that might be developed or in terms of capacity building. And I always say when I wake up and look at this female face, et cetera, I don't see a problem. I actually see perhaps some opportunities. And when I see my students of the same, uh, right, across various backgrounds, et cetera. So could you talk to us a little bit about um, and you have a statement where you say, to me, the number one constituency that we have to serve is our employees by far and away. If you don't have passionate, engaged people who work with you, then you can never aspire to be a great company." End quote. So tell us a little bit about that and the relationship, right, to thinking about an asset model, particularly in these spaces of, of equity and inequity. Yeah. Well, I find it 
amazing that we are still, you know, uh, have a pay gap between men and women, that we still have a pay gap uh, amongst different ethnicities. Um, it's just one study after another has shown that the more diverse an organization is, the stronger that organization is and the better it performs. And if, um, if inclusion is one of your key competitive assets, not just a value, but a competitive asset, and you don't pay people the same amount, like, what are you saying? Like, you know, what you're basically saying is you don't respect you know, their work as much as somebody else's work. And to me, like one of the first things I did when I came into PayPal is I said, do we pay equally for, you know, across gender and ethnicity? And the first thing our lawyers said was, don't ask that question um, because it's very hard to get accurate information. And uh, I said, well, no, 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 that is the question that I'm asking. I want to understand that. And then, of course, when the answer came back, we brought in outside consultants to help us, um, is we weren't. And, you know, we had millions and millions of dollars of gap. And, um, and then, you know, the next thing was, well, you can solve that over a couple of years so that, you know, our earnings aren't impacted by it. And I said, like, look, like let's try and solve it next week if we can, because my whole uh, thought process was, the only sustainable competitive advantage that any company has is the depth of talent that they have in their company and the depth of passion that that talent has. And part of that is, uh, are, are your employees, are employees also financially secure and financially healthy um, so that they're not worrying about making ends meet uh, at the end of the month. And so, you know, I have spent a lot of time and a ton of resource in assuring that our employees um, are proud of the mission of PayPal, which is really to assure that the management and movement of money is for all citizens and not just for the affluent. Um, and that's a very inclusive statement. It's all citizens. So inclusion is at the heart of our values and we act on it. We act on it no matter what the consequences are, we act on that. Um, and then I wanted to make sure that if people were motivated and proud to be a part of PayPal, which we consistently, we just got back our employee engagement results a couple of days ago and PayPal is in the top two to 5% of all companies in terms of engagement and pride um, in terms of working at the company. But we also looked at the net disposable income of our employees. How much money do they have after they pay their taxes and essential living expenses? Um, and I thought we were gonna be great because we pay at or above market. And I figured like capitalism works. Like if you pay at or above market, your employees, are gonna be in good shape. And what I found is that's not the case. For many of our entry level employees, for our call center employees, their NDI, net disposable income, was four to 6%. So they were right at the edge. Any, um, anything like a car breaking down, a medical expense, et cetera, would send them over the edge. And we thought that we needed to be at a minimum of 20% NDI for people to be financially healthy, to be able to save um, and not have to worry about making ends meet uh, at the end of the month. And today we're at 16% minimum. So we've gone from four to six to 16%. Next year, we'll get to 20%. We lowered the cost of healthcare benefits by 60%. Um, we raised salaries. We gave every single person inside PayPal stock equity. Um, restricted shares so they could share in our success. And we wrapped all of that into a financial education program so people could understand what it meant to save. And 
the reactions and the heartfelt emotion that poured out as a result of that and the reduction in absenteeism, the reduction in attrition, the degree of passion in serving customers. I mean, I am 100% sure that over even the short term to medium term, that investment in our employees will pay back multiple fold to our customers and eventually to our shareholders. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Dan. So your answer actually leads to my next question, which is, um, so you've talked a little bit about this in, in my own work. I talk about the democratization of and knowledge in higher education, right? And thinking about democratizing higher education. And you stated that you're focused on democratizing and transforming financial services and e-commerce, um, obviously to improve the financial health of, of billions of families, businesses, and some of which you've just talked about. And also, you've also sort of critiqued in some ways the ways in which capitalism is operated, and particularly uh, Milton Friedman, which is a, 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 an economist theorist who actually, for those of you out there who don't know, who sort of has uh, led sort of the ideas around centralized, centralized capitalism. So, um, and you actually said, uh, I'm just going to quote you again, this whole Milton Friedman, that was not based on math. That was based on the power of a great soundbite and it worked for a long time. But the truth of the matter is, if you don't look at a multi-stakeholder world, you're sub-optimizing what you can be as a company. So can you talk to us a little bit about sub-optimization, the shifts as you see in terms of capitalism and, and, um, and shifting sort of that landscape? Yeah. So, you know, Milton Friedman, everybody on the call knows uh, his maxim, which was, you know, the really sole role of a corporation was to maximize shareholder profitability. Um, and, um, and I, you know, look, shareholders are obviously critical constituents of a corporation, but they're not the only constituent. You have your employees, you have your customers, you have regulators, you have the communities in which you live in, and um, all constituencies are incredibly important. To me, like as I mentioned before, our number one constituency is our employees. Because if you don't have great employees, you don't serve customers well, you don't serve customers well, then your shareholder return over the medium to long term is actually will go down. And I actually think this idea that having a purpose as a company that goes beyond just making money and, um, and maximizing profit are not at odds with each other. I actually think they go hand in hand. Um, and I think if companies don't have a purpose, if they don't step up um, to address the problems that face us as a society, if we abdicate that responsibility to governments or to NGOs, to academia, um, then um, we aren't taking the moral responsibility that we should. We are leaders in our community. We control a tremendous amount of resource. Um, we have a lot of resource to invest, but honestly, we are part of the overall community. Like if people are struggling in communities, um, if there is social unrest and social tension and not social justice, we're a part of that community and that affects us uh, as a business. If we don't put other constituencies on equal footing, then we sub-optimize what we can deliver um, as a company and inside our society. And so I know there are you know, some shareholders who push back on that. But I'm convinced that the success that PayPal has had has been because we've attracted the very best talent to our company who are passionate about what we do. They want to make a difference in the world. They don't want to, ma they don't think about maximizing profit uh, next quarter. Um, they think about how can they make a difference in customers' lives? How do they solve pain points? for customers. And when they do that, by definition, that helps us with relationships with regulators, with governments, 
Uh, it maximizes customer um, satisfaction with what we do and, and what we put out into the market. And, um, and eventually that comes around and serves customers, uh, shareholders extremely well. One thing I will say, Lisa, is I very purposely did not separate ESG to one side of our company and the rest of the company to products and engineering and a whole bunch of things. What I basically said to um, a good friend of mine who came into the company, Franz Pasha, who runs our corporate affairs, when we were first setting this up is, we are not going to set up a foundation and fund it with some extra money. And when times are bad, we'll give less. You know, when times are good, we'll give more. But we are going to put social purpose into our products. I'll give you one quick example, because I know I'm going on long here with this answer. Um, but we, um, we are one of the top five providers of working capital in the United States to small businesses. Not many people know that. And we use our own algorithms to go and do that. And 70% of the over like $15 billion that we've given out to small businesses in the United States goes to the 30% of counties where 10 or more banks have closed branches. And where do banks close branches? They close branches in lower income neighborhoods because they need a certain amount of deposits for their branches to be profitable. And these lower income neighborhoods are disproportionately minority um, uh, neighborhoods. Um, and so our working capital goes to these neighborhoods that could not get loans. And when a business in these neighborhoods gets a loan, their average sales go up by 22% versus the control group that goes up by 1%. And so these are businesses that just need working capital to be successful. And think about that impact that it has in those neighborhoods. Those are sole proprietors who are more financially healthy. Um, they can hire additional people so they can help the uh, employment rates in those neighborhoods. And it's a great win for PayPal too, because their sales go up, they're using PayPal. It's just it's a win, win, win. And that is how I like to design products where social purpose is part and parcel of what we are offering into the market. Thank you very much, Dan. I don't know if you can see what's coming through, but it does seem like the uh, news is announcing that Joe Biden is going to be the next president. Uh, new, this is Andrea. A new day is on the horizon. <laughs> I'm watching the chats. People are texting me. I'm trying to keep the, the beeps down here, Dan. <laughs> so I just wanted to let you know. Oh my God. Uh, cheers are happening. I can hear them outside. Uh, so I know some people, this, as you said, it's been a divisive time, but I at least I wanted to acknowledge that because it looks like Joe, Hi uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris will be the new. Uh, the, the president and vice president. Yes, the streets in Pennsylvania that put them yeah. over. Is that the state that did it? Yes. So, uh, so I have to say, I was going to. My next question was really about the pandemic. So, uh, so maybe this is sort of thinking about uh, Biden and, and the leadership as we move forward. So, um, so this pandemic, of course, has just challenged us all in all types of ways, and we're also talking about right um, the health disparities, and of course um, the racism and xenophobia that we've seen, and the differential impact, uh, obviously, on um, and violence directed toward Black communities, the differential deaths in terms of ind Indigenous communities, eleven times more likely to die, four times more likely, I mean, eleven times more likely to be infected four times more likely to die, disability communities, et cetera. And we've seen the depression on women. And we've also seen that one of our leaders recently said, instead of paying women, we should pay their husbands. Um, and so I'm sort of curious if you could talk a little bit, and I'm again, I'm going to read, you know, I guess I love reading quotes by you. I, I, I want you to know I did my homework. So, uh, so the responsibility, this is you, the responsibility of corporations has moved uh, beyond simply delivering shareholder profits, as you said before. And given, and then, and then I'm uh, going to another quote, given the challenge that the world is facing as a result of COVID-19 pandemic, we are committed to supporting the needs of our employees, customers, and communities and helping them navigate 
this unprecedented time. Our products and services are, are perhaps more critical than ever before, and our PayPal community has come together during this crisis to take meaningful action to help those most vulnerable in our society. And you've also talked about a, re, a sort of awakening of corporate America in terms of a racial awakening. And so could you talk to us a little bit about this awakening and how you see sort of corporate responsibilities in terms of this uh, thinking about where we, where we move next as we deal with right, all that the pandemic has, it has exposed? Yeah. Okay, there were a lot of questions in that. I know, that was a big yeah. one. That was my biggest one. <laughs> Well, I, I'll say this. I think um, I'll start off and then go into a couple of things that the pandemic only heightened awareness of a problem that already existed um, before the pandemic, um, that so many people uh, in our country and around the world struggle to get by. And um, and it's very, very difficult for them. I would say um, at least two thirds of all Americans uh, cannot make ends meet at the end of the month. Um, so this is not, you know, um, a small amount of our country. It is the majority of our country that cannot make ends meet. And, and I think when that happens, it's very, very dangerous because the foundation of our democracy um, is that you have some degree of financial health so you can look beyond your own self-interest and vote for the whole, vote for what's best. Like my favorite quote in democracy is democracy needs to be more than two wolves and one sheep or lamb, whatever, you, the, whatever the singular is of sheep, um, <laughs> voting on what to have for dinner. Okay, so think about that. Like, of course, sheep are gonna to vote to have the lamb for dinner, um, <laughs> but that isn't necessarily what's best for everybody. And, um, and when I look at the number of people who voted in this election, and we spent a lot of time making sure that um, companies would give employees paid time off to vote because the more votes, the stronger our democracy. Um, and, um, um, but we're a very divided country right now. We're a very divided country. Um, and we'll probably have a divided government um, uh, as we look forward. Um, and to me, this threatens really some foundations of, of our democracy and because people feel let down by the system. And so, um, and then because you are struggling so much, you look to the other, right? It's the other's fault. You know, we can't have people coming into the country because we'll lose jobs, you know, and, and people turn against each other instead of reaching out and listening and learning from each other. My dad also gave me a great quote once. He said, son, you're born with two ears, one mouth. Use them proportionately. So like, listen, learn. <clears throat> and so when um, all of the social unrest kind of boiled over after George Floyd's killing and um, so many others, and it just, like, I've never seen anything like it inside PayPal. The depth of emotion and despair and determination and it was really quite something. And, you know, we had been involved in so many uh, social uh, justice causes, but I had never seen this kind of, of overwhelming amount of emotion. And I spent a lot of time talking to Black colleagues inside PayPal, Black leaders inside PayPal, Black leaders across the country, in the clergy, in government, in communities. Um, I know a lot of people and they really helped me to think about what might we do because the knee jerk reaction is to give a couple of million dollars to nonprofits who are doing incredible work on the ground, um, maybe one or two other things. And 
my conversations really said like, we, we need to be sure that this isn't a moment, but a movement. Um, and that PayPal demonstrates that it's in this fight for social justice, for economic equality, to do our part in a place that we can help a little bit, which is the racial wealth gap. Um, and uh, like we can't solve everything, but that is a thing that we can at least try to do our part. And so, you know, we um, decided to really um, step up in what was a very meaningful way. You know, we said we were going to um, put aside $530 million to address um, a number of different issues. Um, one, was to give $10 million of grants, not loans, grants to black owned businesses that were impacted by COVID-19. Because to your point, uh, black owned businesses were going out of business at two times the rate of other businesses. Um, they always struggle to get loans in good times. They could not get loans now. And so we were able to give out $10 million of grants it is beautiful to see the reaction and the difference that we've made. We gave out $5 million of grants to nonprofits um, around the country who are doing incredible work with the Black and Latinx and minority owned businesses and in my, uh, minority uh, communities. Um, and um, we invested inside our company because we can always do better. Um, we've done a lot to increase inclusion, but it's a never ending journey. Um, and, um, and then we put aside $500 million to help um, invest. And we have already invested $100 million of that, $50 million into a, um, uh, uh, Optus Bank, uh, which is a community bank, um, um, and um, 50 million to eight um, venture uh, companies that are led by Black or Latinx uh, leaders, both male and female. And um, we I just approved another $50 million um, the other day that we'll announce shortly that will go uh, and I think be very impactful. And so we are really trying to um, make a difference through not just our products and our services and our being out in the community and standing up for what's right, but putting money behind it as well and a substantial amount of money that I believe will can and should make a difference um, and, um, and demonstrate what all of us should be doing, corporate leaders around the country, as well as those of us on this, uh, on this call as well, stand up to what our responsibility is. Thank you, Dan. And we're uh, please put your questions in. We're going to take questions from the audience. And so my next question really is about the decisions that you've made in terms of what you just talked about, right? And so this is actually one of the questions that's actually also come up is how you've made the decisions, right? In terms of the particular allocations, whether it's 530 or 10 million, 50 million, et cetera, and how you might think about uh, what other corporations and venture capitalists can do in general to accelerate progress more quickly. Yeah, well, I mean, Part of it is we need to look at the numbers. I'm a big believer of looking at numbers and, um, and measuring. Um, and there is such a dearth of dollars that go to uh, black entrepreneurs, Latinx entrepreneurs in the venture community. When you then maybe sub-segment that down to um, gender, it's even worse um, and it's just not acceptable. And like, I talked to, uh, to my team and said, like, are we part of this problem? Because we have a venture um, company and we invest really at A rounds and, and, and above. We don't really do much seed. Um, and it was a big gap for us. And so I'm really excited actually um, about the investments we're making in these venture funds and we'll make direct investments in companies um, 
We'll definitely follow up on that. We may invest in companies as they grow as well. Um, so I, I think that um, you know part part of our role is look at numbers, take responsibility, and then also talk to our peers um, around uh, the country. One thing I am encouraged about, we talked a little bit about this, is I am seeing Fortune 500 CEOs begin to at least seriously discuss Maybe they haven't taken action yet, all of them, but they are seriously discussing what it means to be part of a community. You know, what it means to look into um, the ills that face us, whether it be environment, whether it be social unrest, whether it be economic injustice or social injustice. Um, and I, I'm, I'm really trying to stand up in that part of it as well, not just do what I think is right inside PayPal, but really advocate very publicly uh, in terms of what our responsibility is. And um, as I mentioned, that comes with a lot of um, personal um, personal threats. I mean, there are some, you know, very uh, creative people out there who, you know, like I've seen pictures of me with targets on me and swastikas on my forehead. And, you know, they do a very good job on Photoshop. Um, and, um, you know, that's just part of the territory. Um, and my mom asked me once after I got these death threats after we pulled out of North Carolina because of the bathroom bill, um, because we felt like that allowed for the potential discrimination uh, against people for their sexual orientation or sexual identity. And um, I couldn't even go into a bathroom in a public building without it being searched first um, to see if anybody was there. And um, she said, you know, would you do it again, given, you know, the disruption to your personal life? And I said, like, mom, this is what you taught me. <laughs> Um, and so, of course, I would. I'd do it 100 times out of 100 times. Um, and I believe having that uh, moral authority and acting the right way also is tremendously inspiring inside the company um, as well. Not everybody believes in every action we take at PayPal. We have 35,000 people inside the company. But everyone understands what our values are and that we will act on them. And I try very hard, one last thing, is not to have this dragged into politics. Like I'm not making a, a decision, you know, that's a democratic or a Republican decision. I'm making a values-based decision. Sometimes those get conflated, but like, Fighting against discrimination seems to me to be a red, white, and blue value, not a red or a blue value. Like there's no room for discrimination inside our company, uh, our country, or our companies. I mean, that's part of the values of what um, started our whole country. And so, anyway, I, I feel like um, these are all things that uh, are important. Thank you so much, Dan. So some of the questions that are coming in, and I think we've gotten several questions around this. A couple of them are around, what is it going to take for other corporations to follow PayPal's lead? And then one of the other questions, which is building on some of the things that you just said, is how do you actually, and maybe that people want some concrete examples of, how do you actually talk to other leaders, right, about the work that you're doing either uh, in those sort of behind closed doors sessions. That's what I, I've had some quotes come in behind closed doors. So uh, talk to us a little bit about how, how you do that. Well, I think um, there is a group of CEOs um, that I think are pretty progressive in, in their thought about multi stakeholder capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, 
Satya Nadella at Microsoft, I think is a really good example of that. I think Mark Benioff at Salesforce tries to, to do that. I think Doug McMillan is really stepping up at Walmart, John Donahoe at Nike. Um, but there are a number and, and really what I find is um, I don't try to moralize. Nobody wants somebody to moralize, you know. Um, nobody wants to say, you know, I think you should be doing this and this. What, what I find is very impactful is saying, this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. And these are the results that we're seeing. It may or may not be right for you, but honestly, I feel like it's a big competitive advantage for me. So if you're not doing it, you probably are not having the same competitive advantage that I'm having because I really feel that. And so I think I, I try to put it into two, two uh, kind of categories. One is what is the right thing to go do as we are all humans and we have a certain set of moral values. And then there is like, and what as a CEO do you need to do to create competitive advantage and win in the marketplace over the long term? And here's the great news. They actually go completely hand in hand. And it, it's just showing how that actually does work hand in hand, which is the, uh, the more more challenging part, but the more metrics we have, the more measurements we have, which we, as I mentioned, have a lot of those in place uh, right now, the, the easier it is to have a fact-based conversation and not just a, um, a morals-based one. Because people may have different values and that's fine. That's great. Thank you so much. So our next question, and it actually piggybacks on one of the questions I was gonna ask, which is, how do you think about the role of PayPal in markets beyond North America or the US, especially um, in those areas where there are um, you know, various sort of approaches to this work, whether that's in Africa or Europe, et cetera. And so thinking about your work outside of, uh, outside of the US and how you, we as global companies can think about our work in support of um, inclusive initiatives. Yeah, well, PayPal um, is a global company over, well, just over half of our revenues come from outside of North America. About half our customers, we have about 360 million people who use PayPal. About half are outside of uh, North America. Um, and about half our employees are outside of North America. So we operate in 200 countries or territories around the world. Um, what's um, difficult about that is that different countries and different governments have different, well, rules and regulations, but also different values and different things that they believe in or, um, and you need to respect that but at the same time, the way that I talk about it is like when I travel around the world, I see like, for instance, I, you know, last time I was in Shanghai, you know, I was walking down the, the Bund, which is, you know, the waterfront um, there. And I saw kids running down like the Bund and laughing and parents pushing their kids and taking selfies. And it reminded me exactly of the west side of Manhattan, you know, when you walk down the Hudson River, exactly the same. And I was struck at how similar people are. And like, and then when I talk to even regulators and governments around the world, you know, their number one concern, when they talk to me at least, is financial inclusion. How can we make sure people aren't left behind um, especially as we move into the digital economy. And we are moving rapidly into the digital economy. The pandemic has accelerated that dramatically. And, you know, my view is that um, technology 
um, ought to be able to lower the basic cost of financial services dramatically. Um, it ought to make it uh, safer, faster, um, more secure, easier to understand and less expensive. Um, basic everyday transactions. And if we can do that, we can help to drive financial health. And if you drive financial health, that, that helps bring citizens into um, the world. And, um, and I'm, I'm a globalist. You know, I, I believe that there is no way to separate out our world. It is connected together. Just as there's no way to separate out, you know, Pennsylvania from Ohio. If there wasn't a sign saying welcome to Ohio, you wouldn't know it when you're driving out of Pennsylvania. Like boundaries are, you know, self-imposed and people tend to go across that and ideas go across that and technology goes across that. And I think um, making sure that our values are safe havens across the world um, it, are very important for us. But I try to position it in ways that um, regulators and governments around the world accept. Because the truth of the matter is for not, and this is not universal, and I'm not trying to make a universal statement, most governments care about their citizens. It may be because they care about you know, them being happy and content and others truly want them to move in different directions and, uh, and have certain values. But if we can help in some way create financial health around the world so that people struggle less, then I think people have the ability to listen more think about others. And, um, and I think that can only lead to a more um, peaceful world and one in which we maybe understand each other more than less. And I think that's how I think about our mission and how I talk about it uh, around the world. Thank you. Uh, and the question asker wants me to make sure that I mentioned the Car Caribbean and as someone who has ancestry there, I want to make sure I give a shout out to all the islands. But um, And so this gives me a next question actually and probably will lead actually to talking a little bit more about um, particularly Africa and, the, and some, some of the other locations, which is around digital technology, which you just mentioned, right? And sort of di digital technologies and the digital divides. So if we think about the digital divides, not just obviously in the United States, but globally, we think about broadband access. I know as we went online uh, here at NYU, we had to provide access to some students, right? And, and help them make sure that they had access, not just to laptops, but literally to broadband access. And, and you know about the differentiations there. So could you talk to us a little bit about digital technologies, which you see as the possibilities, but also the challenges uh, as, they, as, you, as they are situated currently? Yeah. Well, um, I'm an optimist, so I'll start with that. Um, a realistic optimist, but, uh, but an optimist it never, nevertheless. Um, I once told my daughter that, um, you know, um, like the secret to, uh, to her success was to, um, to be optimistic and be herself, um, not somebody else. Um, because if you're optimistic, that doesn't always mean things work out, but there's a better chance that they do. Um, and so, um, so on the digital divide, first of all, I see a lot of countries, um, Kenya would be a perfect example, um, that have skipped a generation of payments, just like many developing countries skipped landlines and went straight to mobile. Mm -hmm. telephony. Um, and so um, in Kenya with M-Pesa and um, um, really, I think, skipped a generation of, you know, credit cards and, uh, and really went straight into digital payments and um, uh, using mobile uh, phones and, and retailers and community centers as the equivalent of banks, not just banks, uh, to be able to uh, manage a move and, and change uh, from digital into, into currency um, simply and easily. Um, 
I do think that um, technology um, today and technology tomorrow will be very, very different. It's moving extraordinarily quickly and the cost of technology is dropping dramatically. You know, the cost of a smartphone in India today is maybe $25 uh, or so. Um, and a smartphone enables all the power of a bank branch in the, in the palm of your hand. Um, it reduces infrastructure. It enables things to be done rapidly and quickly. You don't have to stand in line for walk miles and then stand in line for hours to get an international remittance that was sent to you. You can go directly to your mobile phone. And then, you know, if you're in Kenya, you can immediately use that for transactions. Um, but I think that is the way that the world is going to go. I think we are going to lower the cost of transactions dramatically. And, you know, if you're not part of the financial system, managing and moving money is practically a part-time job. I mean, you're waiting in lines all the time, going to places. It uh, really takes away a ton of productive uh, time. I do think today we need to be careful about the digital divide, about broadband uh, capabilities, about um, the ability for people to have smartphones. But for instance, in the US, interestingly, smartphone penetration is higher in lower income levels than it is in higher income levels. Uh, and the reason for that is because it's the only device that somebody has. So they can only buy one device um, because they can't afford to buy a laptop or, a, or an iPad or that kind of thing. So um, uh, lower income neighborhoods and, and populations buy a smartphone and the penetration is higher uh, there. Um, but I do think eventually smartphones become more ubiquitous, as ubiquitous as can be. There's always going to be dead spots and different things, but, but you can be sure that all of the tech companies are working hard on coverage. I mean, sometimes for selfish reasons, but, uh, but they are working hard on coverage. And the cost of technology wants to drop dramatically all the time. As it scales, its costs come down. Um, you know, like software, you know, once it scales, the cost for an incremental user approaches zero. Um, and you know, there. So, um, so I do think, um, at least for what I would call digital wallets, and digital wallets will encompass financial services like savings accounts, investments, credit. Um, um, uh, capabilities, uh, PFM capabilities, um, and payments, all forms of digital payments, all forms of digital currencies from crypto to stable to central bank digital currencies, all the way through to innovative shopping tools. You know, how do you get the best price? How do you get the right, apply the right coupon? And that will apply both online and offline. And those will all be done in, um, in pretty expansive, but inexpensive and efficient ways and very secure. Um, so um, um, governments are aware of digital divides. Companies are aware of that. Um, today, more than 2 billion people are outside the financial system across the world. As I mentioned, even in developing countries like the US, two thirds of the population struggling. Uh, so this is a universal problem. Um, technology is one part of it, but I think it is an important part of it in terms of trying to create both inclusion and financial health, which I think are part of the foundations of healthy societies and healthy political systems as well. Thank you, Dan. So my next question is around new generations. So as we think about emerging generations, um, and one of the things that you said even, uh, to go back to one of your comments around capitalism, is you've said, well, things are certainly out of whack when new generations can't even, may not even be able to support themselves or to think about, right, the ways in which um, they can build on the work that their parents 
uh, capacities. So could you talk to us a little bit about um, new generations? And uh, this is gonna be my last question, uh, new generations, and also a little bit about what you're excited about, right? So uh, what you're excited about next, and talk to us a little bit also about succession planning. For me? No, not for you, just for <laughs> not. <laughs> I, I want to announce. Oh, Dad. No, just okay. planning. Because I'm going to be here for a while. As they emerge. <laughs> not to, if you can see the comments, no one is trying to get rid of you. <laughs> we want to. We want to hold on to you. <laughs> okay, good. Because uh, I like what I'm doing. Um, so, look, we we are um, uh, have a generation that's growing up right now that's very, very different than previous generations. First of all, they are quite disillusioned with the state of affairs right now. It's the first generation ever that does not believe they will do better than their parents. And you think about like kind of like what was the foundation of the American dream? It is you work hard enough and you can get ahead and your kids can uh, you know have a better future and you can provide for them. It's the first generation that does not believe that. Only 25% of this generation believes that capitalism is the right political system or our economic system uh, for us. Um, they are very engaged in social issues, some more in an armchair activist way than actually out on the streets, but all engage and care about brands that care about values and spend time thinking uh, about that. It was a generation that was born on screens, born on screens. Um, and, um, you know, the phone is like their most intimate object like they like what is it it's something like 95 percent of money is like sleep within like two feet of their phone like you know they'll interrupt any act to answer their phone i sleep they with both on, of them right there <laughs> yeah they're on social media constantly and um you know i i think there are and they have more mental stress um, as a result of, uh, of that. And um, so, you know, I worry about the generation coming up. There's a lot of pressure, a lot of pressure on them. Um, but they're very idealistic and, um, and are very technologically savvy um, compared to previous generations. Um, I, you know, I spent a lot of time talking to both my son and my daughter about, you know, how engaged you are. I remember telling my daughter that she does not have 2,200 2, friends. Um, <laughs> Cause like I have like- As you can imagine, I work in higher education. We have to spend a lot of time, right? Talking about these things, yeah. <clears throat> it's unbelievable. She goes, all right, your dad, you're right. I only have 600 close ones. And, uh, <laughs> uh, and, and by the way, another thing in this generation is the, this uh, distinction between private and public is much more blurred. That's right. Um, yes. Then, you know, I'm a very private person. My daughter is, you know, very, very open. Um, and th there's very little distinction between her public life and her That's private right. life. Um, so these are just the way it is. I mean, like all generations kind of um, come into things, but, um, and, you know, previous generations worry about it. Um, but they seem to, uh, to do fine uh, over time. Uh, but I do think this is a generation that is <clears throat> going to be turning to technology more and more and more. And I don't think there's any way to get away from that. I know we're worried about it. I know we're worried about the influence that algorithms can have and everything else. But I do think we need to think about how do we engage in productive ways uh, through technology, how do we tap into that idealistic sense, but also enable the ability to listen to other points of view and not to be so sensitive that, you know, they turn off to 
a, a different point of view, even if it's one you don't agree with. You know, what is that uh, saying? You know, um, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. Um, you know, it's it's really important to know what's happening and not be uh, in a bubble because I think a bubble just uh, spreads our differences and doesn't bring it together. We, and I, and that's by the way you're in academia. This you know it's the hotbed of this right now. And I think you and other leaders in academia have a responsibility to assure that our students and, and, um, and our children can listen to all points of view and, and not be so sensitive that they can't do that. It doesn't mean that they have to change them, but I think listening is a really important skill set. Um, and I, I have to say, you know, I'm optimistic in a lot of, in a lot of cases. I mean, I, I do think we can harness things and do things differently than we've ever had the opportunity to do things before at scale. I think about PayPal, you know, we're closing in on 400 million people using our platform. That is scale. That is, that is the ability to make a difference on a global level. Again, it's our small part, but our small part, like I always believe like every single person matters and every single thing we do matters. And, you know, it may be like a little ripple in, you know, when somebody throws a pebble into water, but if enough of us start, that's, you know, it's like one person begins, the next one follows, and, and that's how change occurs. So I'm very optimistic that, that we can do that. You know, it's why, like, I couldn't wait to talk, you know, at this um, uh, event, because I know you know, the values of people here and what they're trying to accomplish. And, um, and um, like we should all just all hang together, do the things we can do together, keep pushing, and we will make a difference in the world. I'm confident of that. Dan, thank you so much for this conversation. I think it is extraordinary that we were in this conversation as, an, as, as leadership and history was being made. And we know that history is due to, will be made by great leaders and you are one of our great leaders. Thank you so much for this conversation today. Thank you to Culture Shift and thank you um, to all of the participants and thank you for all the questions. Remember everyone out there, take good care. I always say, put your oxygen mask on first before you can take care of others. Uh, so let's do that. Thank you, Dan. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. It was amazing.